And we're ready to go. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the Academy's Morrison Planetarium for our final show of the day. This presentation being uh, a tour of the universe. And what we're going to do is a little bit different from the way we uh, run our other show, Big Astronomy. This show is a, a live flight through a, a model of the universe using a NASA supported piece of software called Open Space that you can actually download for free and try on your home computer. So if you're interested in what you see here today, I can tell you a little bit more afterward where we, how to get to it. I'll be piloting us live. I'm your presenter speaking to you from way back behind you in the control booth, way in the back of the theater. Um, I'll be piloting us live uh, through this uh, model of the universe. I'll try not to crash into any planets or fly into any black holes. But due to the immersiveness of the projection on the dome, which is all around you, if you start to feel a little uncomfortable or uh, a little motion sensitive, just close your eyes and you'll find yourself safely back on planet Earth. We do ask that you not change your seat during the show and that you keep your mask on at all times. Please also refrain from snacking or any kind of photography or recording. In fact, this would be a great time to silence your personal electronics. And we'll have instructions for safe exiting at the end, which will be close to closing time for the museum. But for now, let's take off into outer space and we'll start from a place which is not exactly a well-known uh launch site we're above the, the academy of sciences here in san francisco uh, and you can see the academy right below us there's our green roof and uh, as we take off from here uh we'll just ascend higher and higher away from san francisco you know one famous astronomer once said Outer space is not far away at all. It's only an hour's drive if cars could go straight up. And that's true because the official boundary of outer space as recognized by the International Aeronautical Foundation uh, Federation is uh, 100 kilometers or about 62 miles. Now lately, that number has changed a little bit. NASA uses 50 miles. Um, rather than uh, uh, 62. Uh, basically, uh, outer space begins where aerodynamic surfaces like flaps and wings don't work anymore, and you have to use maneuvering rockets. So now we're 120 kilometers above the Earth. So technically, we're in outer space right now, looking down at the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and, and this is the... Um, uh, we're actually... We're not going to go... We're not going to stop here. We're going to continue moving farther away. Uh, so we can see our Earth, our entire planet, from high overhead. And so there you can see the clouds coming in. And these are all weather patterns that were um, photographed within the past 24 hours. So that is near real-time uh, cloud uh, imagery that you're seeing there. And the farthest that people have traveled from the Earth, or the farthest that they travel from the planet right now, is uh, the International Space Station. And uh, that... Let's see if we can find the space station. You can see the, the maybe we can make out a faint orange line moving uh, diagonally across the Earth, and it's going into the nighttime side um, where the space station is right now. The International Space Station, our current home away from home, is um, is about the size of a football field. It's the biggest thing ever built in outer space. And you can see that faint line, which is the orbit of the space station right there. And as, uh, let's see, we'll zoom in and have a look at it. This is uh, the uh, farthest that humans currently travel from Earth. And it's about 320 miles above the surface of our planet. And is usually occupied by a crew of about six astronauts or cosmonauts from various countries. Uh, it's been occupied continuously since about the year 2000. And the astronauts trade off in shifts of about six months or so. So there's the space station where there are currently about uh, six or seven people on board. And it uh, hopefully will be in operation for another few more years. And uh, as other stations, uh, other countries start to build their own space stations to replace this one, which is pretty old now. It was first uh, launched, the first components were launched in 1998. So it's been in operation for uh, 22, 23 years now. But uh, that is currently the farthest that humans travel from our planet. But humans have gone farther than that. So let's back away from the space station and away from Earth. So let's, let's make sure we turn around so we don't 
crash into Earth as we back away from the space station. So we'll move farther and farther out and have a look at the farthest that humans have uh, ever traveled from our planet. And that would uh, have been a place that we went to about 50 years ago, and that would be to our own satellite, the moon. So let's continue backing out. And as we do, we'll see the Earth receding away from us. And what I'm going to do is uh, back away just enough so that we can zero in on the moon. And let's see if we can put the moon in the center of our field right there and then move in on it. Our satellite is um, our, our one natural satellite. It's about a quarter of a million miles away. Right now it's a thin crescent, as you can see. But uh, one of the things that we can do here in the planetarium is we can actually uh, change the lighting on our planets. And what I can do is turn off the nighttime side of the moon so we can see it a little bit better. There we go. There's our own satellite. And this is the familiar side of the moon that we can see. It's called the near side because it's the side of the moon nearest the Earth. And it's the one side that always faces our planet. The moon rotates around. Um, it rotates at the same rate at which it orbits Earth, and so it always shows us the same face. And so this side, with all those dark patches called Maria, is what we're used to seeing. On the other side of the moon, which is uh, called the far side, that's a more accurate term for it, some people call it the dark side, but that's not the right word, because the dark side is simply the side that the sun's not shining on and that can be any side of the moon. So this is the far side, and you can see the far side of the moon does not have uh, too many of those maria, those dark patches. Those dark patches, by the way, are um, they're large plains of uh, dried lava, which bubbled up about a billion years ago, and they spread out and covered over the, the more heavily cratered areas on the moon and uh, dried into these dark areas. And early astronomers used to think that these were bodies of water. So they called those seas and oceans. And the word mare or maria is a, a Latin word, which means seas. So that's our satellite, the moon. That's the farthest that humans have traveled uh, from Earth, a quarter of a million miles. It took the Apollo astronauts about four days to get there. Uh, it takes uh, radio signals traveling at the speed of light, about one and a half seconds. So there's our Earth and our satellite, the moon, together in space. And, um, you know, when we talk about distances in space, sometimes it gets to be so, um, so mind-boggling that um, using numbers like miles becomes a little silly. It'd be like trying to measure the length of Golden Gate Park here in San Francisco in inches. The numbers just get too big. So astronomers use other terms. And one that they like to use is based on the speed of light. Now, I just said that the speed of light, uh, at the speed of light, the radio signals travel about 186,000 miles per second. And at that speed, it, we would get from Earth to the moon in about one and a half seconds. Well, it would take us a little bit longer to go greater distances than that. And as we back away farther, from the Earth. We can see its orbit there, and um, we'll see the Sun at the center of our solar system and the orbits of the planets. And uh, to get from the Sun to the Earth would take about eight and a half minutes. So at 186,000 miles per second, you can get from the Sun to the Earth in eight and a half minutes. And so that's an interesting thought. If you look at the Sun, you're seeing light that left it eight and a half minutes ago. So you're seeing what the sun looked like eight and a half minutes ago. When you look into space, you're looking back into time because we're looking across such tremendous distances. And when we look at other things in space that are even farther away, we will see things that are so far away that we're looking even farther back in time. Now we're going to back away even more, leave our sun behind, the solar system is getting smaller and smaller in our field of view. You can make out the orbits of uh, the planets, the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The solar system is more than just one star and a bunch of planets. There are also other, uh, other uh, bits of debris and other material, such as the asteroids. We have the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And then we have a, a, a belt of other material 
um, called the Kuiper Belt, which is full of, of chunks of material, uh, which is where a lot of comets are located and, and dwarf planets and other things as well. But let's back off away from the solar system, which uh, according to scientists is about eight um, light hours in diameter. So that means a beam of light would take eight hours to cross from one side of the solar system to the other. So you can think about the distances from things in outer space in terms of, of those lengths of time. Now, as we back away even more, um, we're going to let the sun uh, assume its normal brightness. We'll change that just a little. We've been cheating a little bit because we've been keeping the sun a little dim so that uh, it doesn't wash out our view of the planets. So there's the sun, the same relative brightness as the other planets or the other stars that we see. And now we're backing away from the sun, from our solar system, and you can see the stars whizzing past us. And as we travel farther and farther out, um, you will see that our star is just one of many, many stars in the sky. In fact, uh, there are uh, believed to be something like a, a few hundred billion stars in the Milky Way. I'll talk a little bit more about the Milky Way in just a couple of minutes. But there's one more thing that I want to show you. Uh, I will come back in just a little bit. And that is the farthest that not, not humans have traveled, nor our spacecraft, but rather the, the, the most uh, distant artifact of humanity is our radio signals. Our radio signature is formed by this bubble that you see right here, which is as far as our radio signals have traveled since we started broadcasting. So that's about roughly 100 light years in, in a radius. So a light year is the distance that light travels in one year or about six trillion miles. And so we've been broadcasting radio signals into space for about a hundred years or so. And so this is our radio signature in outer space. If there are any stars inside that radio bubble, and there are a few, um, they, they might be within reach um, of, uh, of our radio signals. Uh, and and uh, they, they, if there are any civilizations orbiting those stars, they may have picked up our radio signals. But if there are any civilizations uh, capable of detecting radio signals farther out in space than our radio bubble. They have not heard our radio signals yet. They wouldn't know about us. So there's another way of thinking about how big the universe is, how fast things travel, and, and how far away things are. So let's continue traveling farther out. And as we travel farther off into space, um, we'll see what a small part of our galaxy um, our radio signature is. Remember, that's about 100 light years in radius, roughly 200 light years across in diameter. But about, uh, about 100 or so years ago, astronomers discovered that the Milky, the, the Milky Way, which we can see as a faint band of light crossing the night sky, it is, uh, it's just part of this large disk of stars that we can see now. As we back away even farther, the Milky Way is a huge disk of stars with spiral arms winding out from the center. Our star, the sun, is not at the center of the galaxy. It's about two thirds of the way out along the edge of one of these spiral arms. About a hundred or so years ago, you know, astronomers used to think that the Milky Way was the only galaxy in the entire universe. They thought it was the entire universe. But roughly a hundred years ago, astronomers discovered that there are other galaxies. The Milky Way is not alone. There are many other galaxies in space, and the Milky Way is just one member of a small cluster of galaxies known as the local group. Now, the local group contains about two or three dozen galaxies. Uh, another member of the local group is the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, but uh, this is a, a fairly small cluster of galaxies in space. Now that we've left the galaxy behind, Every point of light that you see here, all those dots, those are not stars. Now they're galaxies. Each one of those points of light that you see is a whole galaxy containing several hundred billion stars like the Milky Way itself. And as we back off even more, we'll see that um, 
uh, some galaxies are clumped together into giant clusters called super clusters. And as we back off, we'll see the structure of uh, the distribution of galaxies in the universe. We'll see that uh, there are clumps of galaxies uh, separated by voids or empty spaces. The texture of the universe is almost foamy or spongy, as some have described it. And it looks like a, a, a great web of uh, many clusters of galaxies, as you can see. And what we're seeing right here is all based on actual information. It's based on real observations taken by uh, astronomers. So this is real data that we're seeing here. We're not making up this map of the, of the universe. These are the locations of galaxies and galaxy clusters in our universe. As we back away even more, we'll see that structure a little bit better, and we'll begin to see something rather unusual about the uh, distribution of galaxies in the universe. Right here, we've got this very nice view of uh, our 3D map of the universe as we've, as we've determined it so far. And it, it has this unusual shape. It looks something like a, like a big butterfly or a bow tie. It's got that big empty space at the, at, around the, the middle uh, with two great fans or cones stretching off on either side to either direction. Is this the actual shape of the universe? Well, no, it's not. Uh, the empty area that we see right here around this area is um, just parts of the universe that we haven't mapped yet. So there's more stuff there. We just haven't seen it, not, not too well anyway, because there's stuff in the way, and that stuff is uh, largely stuff that's in our own galaxy. It's our own galaxy with its dust and, and gas that's blocking our view of more distant galaxies farther off in space. So right now, this is uh, the shape of our our map of the universe, but we do expect it to get better and to get filled out a lot more. So as we back away even farther than that, we'll see some of the more distant objects. The most distant things that astronomers have detected in the universe are things called quasars, and those are the centers of very, very young infant galaxies, and those are those orange spots that you see at the edges of those great fans right there. And those are some of the most distant objects that have been observed by astronomers. And now we're looking off at, at things that are billions and billions of light years away from Earth. The most distant thing ever that has been detected, what surrounds us and comes from all directions is a faint hiss, a background radiation called the cosmic microwave background. This was predicted uh, in 1948. Now, about 100 years ago, when astronomers discovered that there are other galaxies in the universe, they also discovered that the, the universe, the galaxies, are moving farther and farther apart. So the universe was not only big, it was getting bigger. So at some point, the, the expansion of the universe had to have begun somewhere. And astronomers did some calculations and figured that that expansion probably began about 14 billion years ago. They calculated, somehow, how hot the universe must have been at that point in time. And then when the universe began to expand, they calculated what temperature the universe should have cooled off to after about 14 billion years. And they came up with a figure that was around three degrees above absolute zero. Well, in 1948, when this radiation was detected, coming from all directions, pervading the entire universe, they did some measurements and, and found that the temperature of that radiation was about three degrees above absolute zero. So what they found was the faint background, the faint echo of what some astronomers call the Big Bang, the beginning of the expansion of the universe. And that is held as the best evidence of that, uh, that uh, event the beginning of the spread of the galaxies. That mottled texture that we see around us is uh, actually a temperature map that shows slight differences in the temperature of the material 
um, in the early universe, which shows the beginning of uh, differentiation and clumping of material to form stars and galaxies. Now, this is as far out as we can go in space. That's as far out as we have seen. So let's travel back in. A couple of things occur to us. Our map of the, the universe seems to suggest that we're at the very center of everything. And we're not. That's not really the case. It, that only looks that way because we're the ones who made this map. It's all based on our perception, our, our perspective, our field of our, our point of view. We're looking all the way around us at, at different things. But also, I said that this map is not quite complete because it's not entirely uh, filled out. Even if it were, the most mind-boggling thing about it is that that is not all there is to the universe. The universe is really one mind-boggling thing after another. According to astronomers, the motions of the galaxies that we see cannot be accounted for by the amount of mass that we can detect, not by the galaxies that we can see with our eyes through our telescopes. There's got to be more material in the universe to cause the motions that we see. So this is something called dark matter. And that is believed to make up about 75% about of the entire universe. So most of the universe is stuff that we can't see. That's an amazing thought. We're moving back in now through our radio bubble. And one thing that I want to point out is um, that there are um, other solar systems, as we head back in toward our own, there are other solar systems that have been detected since about 1994. And here is a map of the known extrasolar planets that astronomers have discovered. More than 4,100 so far. And of all those other planets that we know of, um, do any of them have conditions that might allow life to exist, like Earth? We don't know yet because a lot of those planets are so far away we we don't know much about them other than that they exist but in order for planets to host life you've got to have the right kind of planet it's got to be made of the right stuff it should be earth-like it should have a rocky surface it can't be gaseous it can't be too cold it can't be too hot it has to orbit the right kind of star so it gets just the right amount of radiation from its star to uh, for life to exist and survive and it has to have the right uh, kinds of elements and minerals and other compounds that would allow life to exist. It's got to have uh, liquid water on its surface. It's got to have the, the, the right kinds of nutrients for life to, to live on. And so there are lots and lots of conditions that are required in order for life to exist on the surface of a planet. And so far, of the more than 4,000 other planets that we know about, there's none that really has the same conditions that we find here on our own planet Earth. The Earth is the one planet that we know of that has life and has the conditions that allows life to exist, which makes our planet a very special place, the one harbor of life in all the universe. It's a special place that is unique and, as we're finding out, very fragile, the place that we need to do our best to preserve and protect so it can continue to host life on its surface. And with that, welcome home. We find that in the entire universe, there's no place like this world that we live on. And so let's do what we can to take good care of it. Thank you all very much for joining us on our tour of the universe. We hope we've enjoyed it. And uh, it is now just about closing time for the museum. Um,